I never wanted to do a pedagogical film. Uh, I think there's a whole number of great places to learn about general relativity and cosmology. A movie theater is probably not one of them. <laughs> um, uh -huh. So how to construct a movie out of this material. Um, one of the things I don't like about this film is it's one of the very, very few things that I've done as a director for hire. I don't know if someone is about to hire someone in this audience to make a movie. Well, there are a number of pitfalls. Uh, the biggest among them is you lose complete control of the movie you're trying to make. Um, it's all coming back to me now. They tried to fire me several times during the making of this movie. Who was they? Who was they? Oh, we all know who <laughs> they are. <laughs> um, among them, Steven Spielberg. That's they, for sure. Um, I wasn't even sure I wanted to make the movie. I was a graduate student years and years ago at Princeton in history and philosophy of science. So I'm not really a complete stranger to this material. In fact, John Wheeler, who is the guy in the movie, gave black holes their name was one of my teachers. Um, I read the book on the plane to London. Uh, uh, I was meeting Hawking for the very, very first time. And I really liked the book, but it seemed to me the book had been misreviewed. At least the book that people had been reviewing was substantially different than the book that I was reading. Um, not a completely uncommon occurrence. I think the same thing could be true, by the way, of, in retrospect, McNamara's book. Uh, very, very, very different than the book that was reviewed. Uh, one thing that immediately occurred to me this also is true of McNamara's book, is that they were both thinly disguised, maybe not even so thinly disguised, autobiographies. Uh, yeah. Brief History of Time is not a book of science exposition. Um, if you tried to learn about this material from the book, I believe you would be either sadly disappointed or uh, totally delusional. <laughs> What the book did do really successfully is it turned the elements of Hawking's inquiries into stories about him. Um, there's this well-known uh, literary term called the pathetic f fallacy, which was used for 19th century poetry. Um, and supposedly, the pathetic fallacy is, is imbuing nature with human-like attributes, say life, uh, birth, death. Well, <laughs> um, the pathetic fallacy is all over this movie. I mean, it's the essence of his science. Um, and I came to believe the pathetic fallacy was not really a fallacy anyway. Um, except I have a new interpretation which I'll share with you. Um, the real pathetic fallacy um, uh, imbuing human beings with human-like qualities. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the movie was really never seen in 
the United Kingdom. No one really knew what to do with the movie. Um, it didn't seem like a science movie. Um, it didn't seem like a biography. People were annoyed because the movie was made at a time when Stephen Hawking divorced his first wife, Jane. So that's why she wasn't in the movie, I'm assuming? That's correct. Um, uh, in fact, it made the movie almost impossible to make because as in any divorce proceeding, people split up. There were the people who liked Jane, and then there were the people who liked Stephen, and the people who liked Stephen would talk to me, and the people who liked Jane would not talk to me, and so on and so forth, which made it very, very, very difficult. I, um, I tried very hard to persuade Jane Hawking to be in this movie, and I even went over her house, um, and they had a cello there. I play the cello, but I hadn't been practicing regularly. <laughs> and they made me, they made me play the cello for them. Um, yeah. I've often thought, I told this to Stephen Hawking, that if I had played the cello better that night, perhaps they would have been in the movie, but it didn't work out. Um, why do I like it? Um, it has a strange dreamlike quality to it at its best. Um, life is a kind of strange dream. Uh, and no one at that time knew how much longer Hawking would last. Well, of course, he's lasted for over 20 years. Um, traveling less, he used to show up where I live. He calls it the pseudo Cambridge, Cambridge, Massachusetts. He would show up where I lived. He's had dinner at our home, I don't know, maybe half a dozen times. Uh, but he travels much less now. I even have thought of updating this thing. There's no DVD available of it. It's never been transferred properly. Uh, so it's c entered some kind of netherworld, a black hole, if you like, <laughs> of its own. <laughs> so I'm really delighted that you're showing it here. This is fantastic. Um, autobiography. I had trouble with hawking. Because Hawking kept telling me, uh, you knew I didn't want a biography. And I kept saying, well, you shouldn't have written the damn book. <laughs> and he came to like it. It's kind of a miracle in and of itself. But just think of all of the metaphors uh, rattling around in this story. Um, uh, a universe without a really specific beginning in time, black holes from which nothing can escape, or maybe they can. Um, uh, hawking in his wheelchair, uh, becoming more and more incapacitated, that strange on-off switch, that clicker through which he communicates. Um, you may have noticed in the movie, I just can't bear to watch these things after I finish them, by the way, so I kind of just came at the very end, <laughs> snuck in. But you may have noticed that there are these Marilyn Monroe. Yes. What is his thing with Marilyn Monroe? Well, I always wondered, what is his thing? <laughs> Am I just parroting what you said? What is his <laughs> thing with Marilyn Monroe? And I had this epiphany, I, um, which I shared with Hawking. I said, I get it. Um, I know why you really love Marilyn Monroe. Because like you, she's someone appreciated f for her body and not her mind. And he gave me this very odd look. <laughs> and then finally he said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I really love the guy, by the way. I mean, what is there not to love? He's really, really, I'm not saying anything even remotely controversial here. He's really, really smart. <laughs> <laughs> he's really funny. And he's really perverse. It's my kind of guy. <laughs> Would you be willing to take a couple of questions? Of course I would. I'm sorry for talking no, so No, no, not at all. Back there. Well, thank you. I don't think it was a limitation except for the fact that there were producers who had bought the underlying material and I did not own it. That made a very big difference. But otherwise, I can't think of any difference. Um, in the case of Fog of War, McNamara had written a whole number of different books that influenced the movie and informed the movie from In Retrospect to Wilson's Ghost. Um, I didn't buy the rights to those books. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, it's really the same thing. I mean, this wasn't just a strict uh, painting by numbers version of Brief History of Time. At least I don't think it was. Maybe that's what got me into trouble. Here. Spielberg said he had hoped it would be more like Powers of Ten. Now. I really like Powers of Ten. You know. <laughs> Don't get me wrong here. But um, I had something different in mind. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned your uh, position about being hired. If you, if you had not been hired and had done this, um, you know, what, what major changes would you, what approach would be different? Well, if I had, this is a question of what I would have done if I had not been hired. And if I had not been hired, I would have done nothing. <laughs> it's kind of a moot point. <laughs> People are always saying to me, you know, I have a wonderful idea uh, for a movie. You'll really like this one. And, you know, my... My inevitable question is, where's the bag of cash? <laughs> yes, please. No bag of cash, no movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How did they, that vision thing. Um, I don't think it would have been any different, actually. I think I would have made the same movie. Um, uh, you know, the movie needed a certain amount of money uh, in order to make it possible. The movie I'd made previously was The Thin Blue Line. And I was schlepping camera crews all around Texas really bad places, Vider, Orange, Beaumont, Dallas. <laughs> um, and I thought, this next time around, I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm just going to plant myself like a kind of, I don't know, you know, an asparagus plant. I'm going to plant myself somewhere, and then everyone's going to come to me. Um, it does suggest a certain uh, pinch of megalomania. <laughs> However, it seemed to work out really well. We set up in Elstree Studios outside of London, and then we just brought all of these guys in, which was, in I mean, it was a lot of fun for me. 